Let me start by thanking uh, Juanma for uh, putting us in contact with Hugo and Stein, uh, both experts in crisis management. I think they're based in Belgium, but they've been working internationally on, on crisis before they, they have the institute around that. So we thought that probably there's no better topic to start discussing and thinking about. Um, so I ask uh, them to prepare a 20 minutes presentation on on past experiences, on on what can we be doing, uh, thinking, uh, how to approach and be prepared for what might, uh, yeah, be longer period than expected and larger consequence than we initially thought. So that's going to be the main part of, of today's session. Um, I, I don't know if you managed to see the mail I share. I've been thinking, like probably all of you, what can we do? What can we do to get things better? And I think um, it would be good to narrow down the options where we can contribute. I think uh, I've been thinking, can I help in a hospital? No. Can I help uh, on the urgency that uh, people are having now? Oof, very difficult around the healthcare and medicine and, and medical devices. But can, where can we be more pragmatic and helping? And maybe are those people who are suddenly uh, without a job or um, so these kind of thoughts are in my mind to try to be more specific on where we can contribute. Um, there is a lot of knowledge available for free. So yes, but what knowledge and how can we target some people to, to help? So this is just things that we can brainstorm and maybe narrow down. Um, and uh, but first of all, thank you, Hugo. Thank you, Stein, for their uh, being here. Um, as you can see, this is a super international group, uh, many uh, friends, and we're just eager to learn and see how we can react better in the current circumstances and and hopefully help as well. Um, that's I think our purpose is to help. We are the lucky ones so far, so yeah. So let me just share, um, please type any questions or so in the chat. Uh, you want to make a comment or a point. I think the best to flow the, the meeting is that uh, we leave the floor to Hugo and Stein for 20 minutes. They make their uh, exposition and then we have a dialogue. Um, and to facilitate, I think the best is just to use the chat uh, or you raise the hand and, and so that we don't talk all at the same time. Um, and so let's get started. Uh, Ugo, you want to start? Yep. Uh, is it okay? We, we prepared a very small slide deck. So if Stan, Stan does have the slide deck, so if he can bring it up, that might be helpful. Stein, I'm looking at you. All right, there we go. Okay, so first of all, uh, Antonio, thank you for uh, having us here today. Uh, also, thank you, uh, Juanma, uh, for introducing us. Uh, and that's where networks are so important for, uh, to, to bring each other together. Um, yeah, let's go to the first one. Uh, the first slide, just a very, very short introduction uh, to both of us, uh, Stan and myself. Uh, we're already in uh, crisis management and crisis communication for over 15 years. Uh, we are both uh, partners at uh, a consultancy firm that's called PM Risk, Crisis and Change. Um, and we are working both for government, uh, private companies, uh, profits and non-profits. Next to that, we do have a, uh, a non-profit organization, which is CIP Institute. Uh, we are both co-founders together with uh, Juan Manuel and a couple of other people in uh, uh, UK, France, uh, Portugal, and Switzerland. Uh, Belgium and Holland, of course. Uh, and the whole idea of the CIP Institute is to bring people together uh, who are uh, looking at complexity, at complex infective processes, risk, crisis, uh, all, all of that, uh, and try to exchange knowledge, information, also do some research. Um, and then uh, of the 
Team D5 here in Belgium. That's a crisis communication team linked to the Belgium Federal Crisis Center. Um, we launched that team and trained that team back in the days, 2013. Uh, and the first uh, big proof of concept was uh, were the terror attacks in Brussels uh, on March uh, 2016, four years ago, where the team did great, great things. And today also, they, they this team is working on a daily basis from very early morning till very late in the evening. And we still support the team uh, in the crisis communication uh, on the corona, uh, the corona disease. A little disclaimer, uh, we are not project management experts. Uh, so don't expect us uh, to use your language. Uh, uh, we have some knowledge about it, but we are not experts on that. Okay. So uh, the presentation we're going to give is basically we, we have five uh, themes, five topics, uh, that's five trending themes that we see happening over the last two, three weeks, and that we'd like to share with you. And um, also, we don't have a magic stick, uh, and there is no magic stick for, for solving this, this crisis. Um, so don't expect from us cut clear answers, uh, giving all, all the information. So this is, um, to start with, the first one is, um, this is typical communication model. It comes back from last century, uh, 49. Uh, Shannon and Weaver, uh, it's about communication and how communication works. And then you typically have the sender, you send a message through a channel and it goes to a receiver. And then you have the feedback loop. Uh, this is a, a, common, a very old communication model. I don't like it for the simple reason that after uh, the receiver gets the information, then a miracle occurs and people will do things. What we currently see in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is that we expect that after we give information, then all of a sudden people will act and do something with it. And then it will have the effect and the effect that we intended to have. And reality is a little bit more complicated than that. So that's what we're going to discuss in, in this short presentation. Is this my slide or is this yours? <laughs> you, you, you're, you're doing great, Hugo. You're doing great. <laughs> okay, I'm on the roll. So, uh, so the thing is, uh, if, if, if you look at crisis management, you can say that we can handle all kinds of problems, right? complex problems, very simple problems, very complicated problems. But the problem we see with COVID-19 today is that we are no longer dealing with the traditional crisis situation. Uh, we are dealing with uh, a, what, what they call a wicked problem or a meta problem. And a meta problem, um, typical uh, thing with a wicked or a meta problem is that there is no cut clear answer to the problem. We don't know what the solution is. Um, and what we are trying to do today is, yeah, we try to flatten the curve yeah, and, and there are a lot of measures to get a grip on the situation, but we don't know whether the, the virus will, will change, will it mutate, will it uh, come back, will people who got the disease, will they be immune or not? Um, so therefore we are in what we call a fog of war. Uh, we don't know what is before us uh, and once we go forward, the fog will close behind us. So we don't know if the decisions we are taking right now are the right decisions. And that's something interesting to think about. So, so the question is, is this a typical crisis or are we talking about different things? Our personal view is we are talking about some, something completely different. So everything we learned uh, during crisis situations and how to tackle them and how to approach them, all of a sudden they are not really useful facing the COVID-19 situation. Yeah, that's uh, what we've been looking at for a couple of years now. I found one slide uh, of uh, Philip Husser on, on Twitter, uh, which intrigued me back in the day because it was on project management. And I uh, also had a couple of talks with uh, Juan Manuel on this, um, which intrigued me by those two axes of uh, having 
uh, to choose a project management uh, solution from the agile realm. Um, we as crisis managers, we like to have, uh, um, to, we borrow concepts from all kinds of domains. Um, and, and project management is one of them. And uh, we see that certain or an uncertain outcome and in the other axis, we have a simple or a complex um, uh, way of managing over time. Um, now, we, we don't really find um, the right solution for wicked problems or uh, meta problems uh, in this chart. So I want also want to give this back to you as project managers. Um, what happens when things get chaotic on the one side and unknown as an outcome on the other hand? Um, that is where we are looking at solutions right now and we are trying to implement what we know. Uh, but this one, as Hugo mentioned, is also for us a very strange one because the scale of uh, the crisis is uh, uh, global uh, and it is from an individual level to a planetary level and all the scales uh, in, in between those two. So it is for us also a, a learning experience. Uh, so one of the things that we uh, have seen that is what helps out very uh, many people um is the need to be creative um people get very creative um and we should also be pushing people to get creative um the visual on the on the right side is uh the the praise of the financial times for the crisis communication of belgium right now because we have uh, uh well the team d5 has installed uh, technical press conferences instead of political press conferences so by installing uh, press conferences with only experts um you get rid of a lot of fake news and you can get rid also of the of the of the political fights in the in the media which is very good on the point of crisis communication so this is one of the lessons we have learned from the terrorist attacks uh, when we were getting creative back in the day uh, to keep um, the, the public informed as, as best as we could. And now we see that this concept has been used again, but in a different uh, crisis situation. So it's this concept of uh, a creative concept that came along a couple of years ago now gets better and better uh, every time that a technical press conferences come along. On the other hand, we see that the individuals, uh, just the public, is getting very creative. We see a lot of hackathons on how to deal with this. We see Facebook support groups. We see the, the, the local community websites where, where, where it's very localized. People helping out each other a lot. Uh, people who are knitting medical masks all around the globe. Uh, to help out each other. So once again, we see that on, on those two extremes, it's the government on the one hand is getting very creative and the individual is getting creative. So we see that to cope with uh, a crisis of this magnitude, we see that creativity is getting spurred and creativity gives people hope and people uh, have uh, um, anchors to, to uh, get around uh, a lot of... Uh, this nastiness of the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, reach out and touch. Uh, that's another trend we see. So in this regard, we see that if, if you go back to the traditional problems, uh, there you can see that um, they can be solved by linear connections. So if you have, for instance, an explosion in a chemical plant, uh, you get the first responders, you get everyone involved, you can easily predict what the outcome might be, maybe not in all details, but still, it's a very linear set of connections that you have to solve it. Now, when we're looking at wicked problems, um, there we see that all of a sudden, a couple of networks do exist. And you have not only among the first responders, but also at other levels, at other um, sectors and other uh, areas in the society, 
all of a sudden all these networks are start to work and they start to, to integrate and they start to connect with each other. One of the examples is the reason that we are sitting here this afternoon in this conversation. We would never have been in touch with, with you guys, but all of a sudden through these networks, we're gonna, we're gonna meet each other and we start talking about a problem and how we might find some solutions uh, to get over it. So these networks, uh, they connect existing knowledge uh, from various levels, different domains. But also we see today not only these first responders and virologists who come in, but we also see that, and that's a very interesting uh, new trend we see, is that we get psychologists on board. Uh, we got uh, sociologists on board, uh, ethical advisors, uh, uh, communication experts to reach to, to specific groups, to youngsters, to people with a migration background, uh, to people who, do, who don't speak our language uh, or the language from, from, from the country they are living. Um, so this might be, and once again, it's a trend we see, and, and we do believe that maybe for, for managing these kinds of, of crisis situations, you don't need a traditional, traditional approach, but maybe we need to have a kind of network of networks approach. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, building on that also, um, and, and, and on what I see happening on the chat, thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing your insights uh, during our talk as well. Um, I see the word fear coming up a lot, and, uh, and, and it's true, what we do uh, uh, on a daily basis uh, on all kinds of crisis uh, situations is uh, uh, analyzing perceptions and sentiments. Uh, so by, by fixed methodology, we look at how people are feeling, um, how, how big of the impact is were in, in different levels of the society, and what are the information needs. Those three criteria are always used in the analysis we do, uh, which we call sentiment or perception analysis. And fear, and, uh, and fear, sadness, and anger are the three main emotions we see in all kinds of uh, crisis situations. But in this situation, situation of, on COVID, we see a, a vast uh, amount of fear um, is, is the, the main emotion, fear of touching people, uh, fear of um, dying, uh, dying alone, uh, fear of uh, going outside to the shop, uh, fear of not being governed uh, to, by working from home. We see a lot of different expressions of fear. Um, and that's one of the biggest uh, challenges we have, uh, uh, not only as crisis communicators, because we detect that and we can, we can have a talk with uh, uh, different kinds of levels, uh, but still we need to have a crisis governance level on how to deal with this fear. Um, I, and I, I, I stumbled across a tip of Marta Acosta, it's a US uh, uh, advisor on all things VUCA, and uh, she said we should be um, dealing with uh, our emotions um, in this disruptive time by disrupting ourselves. I really like that uh, quote that disrupt yourself. It is, it is the last thing a person wants to do in uncertain time. It is adding more uncertainty. But by doing that, um, you, you, you really address your own emotions uh, in a crisis. And that's all, not only on a personal level, but it's also if you are a leader of a business, um, your business will be different. It is now the time. Uh, to have a, a good look at your organization. Or if you're leading a country, you have to have a good look at your country. So it is the same way in, of, of dealing with these uh, fearful emotions. It is being bold, like somebody said on the chat, it's, it's now is the time to be courageous and being bold and look uh, at your own emotions and acknowledge them and take them forward. Forward. So Marta Acosta uh, really points that out. Uh, also, the need for information. This this is the time to experiment a lot. We talk about experimentation a lot, but not not always. We, we find the time to do it or or the courage. Now we can do uh, experimentation because we are in a very unusual period of time. Um, I. 
from my part, I would like to end with uh, an old quote of uh, Bent uh, Sindelius, who's a crisis thinker as well. Um, we all have heard of this uh, Chinese sign for a crisis where we say yeah, we have an opportunity on the one hand and danger on the other hand. Um, uh, ben Sandilius, he moved that forward and he said to cope with the crisis, leaders need solutions that are unorthodox, uh, that are new, that are novel for the whole of the organization be it a, go a government or be it a, a business or be it a household, decision makers must seize the opportunities to reform, innovate and take active leadership during a crisis. This is so difficult to explain if you look at these simple crisis situations. Uh, but now that we have this vast, uh, immensely impactful situation, this really resonates with a lot of people. So I hope it resonates with you as well and that you uh, um, find some clues in the tips that uh, I provided. Okay, and then the last one, uh, giving a little bit of hope. Uh, Renaissance follows the plague. Will this end? Yes, for sure. Uh, will we return to normal? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, we will evolve on all scales into what we can call a new normal. Uh, and how will this new normal look like? That's up to humanity. Uh, remember that something great came after the plague uh, and it was Renaissance. A Renaissance uh, started with people who were very, uh, very creative, uh, came up with some, some new ideas uh, who based on what previously Stan said, uh, were experimenting, were doing new things and this led to something new. So bringing this or linking this to new projects, new ideas, uh, projects we plan today, well, they might have a huge impact on how we live tomorrow. Um, future is uncertain, but one thing for sure, this will get over one day. When? We don't know. It's something new might come. So just to end up with a positive note. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you, Stein. It's, um, yeah, it, it brings different perspective uh, to the crisis we're, we're going through and, and, uh, and yeah, the scale uh, that we've never seen something similar before. And I love what you said that uh, decisions that we made, we're not sure even if they're right. So it's, it's a lot of testing and, and uh, I see that with the numbers and with the actions from the governments, there's a lot of um, ag agility in place on, on very sensitive and, and difficult topics. I'm not sure they really understand how, how to manage the things, the leaders that we have today. But thank you. I really appreciate the time that you took today on a Sunday just to share with, uh, with us your views and some ideas on how to uh, think forward. I, I want to open, if you don't mind, the floor to some questions. <laughs> Um, uh, if there's anything specific or a point you want to raise, just type it on the, please, uh, let's put your in the chat and I'll, I'll give you, uh, uh, I'll open the mic for, for who wants to talk. So uh, just put mm -hmm. it in the chat and I'll, I'll just Can, follow. Uh, I'm now going over some of the remarks. So yeah, yeah, you can. Okay if, I, if I uh, respond to some some of the remarks, um, uh, someone said, "Who was it here?" Uh, oh, so many. <laughs> there is very so very remarks. active. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, maybe uh, stepping a little bit into the fear thing. Uh, so typically what you see is that, and it's from a psychological point of view, so fear is creating uh, stress levels. So if you have fear, stress is going up. And a way of dealing or tackling stress and, and getting stress back is uh, giving information. Uh, so the very moment you get information, your stress level might go down. And second thing is giving people something to do. Now, the whole situation here with COVID-19 is, uh, we don't know. Uh, you can give some information. Yes, you can tell people what to do, wash your hands, stay inside, keep the social distancing. 
but still, what should we do with our business? What should we do with, with society? What should we do with elderly people? So there are still a lot of questions left. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, why there is still this fear and while, while, while at the same time still stress levels are quite high. So as long as we can't give final answers, and that's also, again, linked to the wicked problem is there are no clear-cut answers. So we have to live with some questions that are left uh, and that we cannot really, really address. Thank you, Goim. Uh, Marcello has some comments. Marcello, where are you based now in Switzerland? I'm in Austria. I managed to make it to Austria from Italy. And hi, everybody. And so I've seen actually both situations in Italy where, you know, it's extreme and in Austria where it's less. It was very interesting to see also the different uh, awareness that you had in the different two countries. Uh, but maybe just for the, to give time for everybody to comment, uh, what I wanted to share as, as I was hearing the conversation, so this group obviously has an enormous potential because of the skill set. Uh, there's, there's a few things that I think we need to be clear. So it seems like we really want to contribute based on this skill set. And I was thinking, so what can we do to help, as you were asking, Antonio? And then the first you know, question that I had, what is it that people really need beyond the obvious, right? Uh, there's the safety aspect, there's the, the, um, the, the social aspect, there's the physiological aspect. But I think one thing that maybe this group should do as, as a next step is to understand what is it that people really need? And by the way, which people? Because you've got all sorts of groups. You've got the elderly who are alone. You've got people losing jobs. You've got to see their kids and cannot. There's a whole variety of situations and we need to decide who can we help to. Um, but then I was thinking, what is it? What are the competencies, just like in strategy? What are the core competencies that we have as a group? And I, I will list 10, I will go fast, don't worry. But I think we're really big on connection. Uh, clearly, this is why we're in this call, the network. Uh, but this is, is, is quite big. Um, I think compared to other individuals, the fact that we have connections help us to be reassured. We can, our fear levels are probably lower because we can communicate to each other, we can reassure each other. So, you know, leveraging the network to communicate maybe to some of these groups that are less, less advantages, that, that could be a skill. Um, you were mentioning the fact of getting different heads. Uh, so somebody was mentioning different heads and different experiences together. There's this concept of creative collisions where you put, I don't know, a virologist and a project manager and a musician together. And that gives you real innovation edges. I think we've got the potential to do this. As project managers, we're strong in problem solving. So one other thing that I, if I had a small sized business <clears throat> and I was finding myself in a situation like this, I would really, really appreciate somebody helping me with problem solving tools. How do I go about framing a problem and finding solutions? And um, I'll go even faster than what I wanted. Um, you, um, I think a colleague, uh, Steen, maybe you were mentioning, what are the project management uh, a skills, methodology, and tools that we could tap into. For complex problem, uh, projects, there's a whole piece of work done by Carol Bellack uh, and uh, colleagues in, in Boston on um, uh, NLP, so Neuro Linguistic Programming Skills that Project Managers has. Uh, how do I manage complexity and uncertainty? It goes to direction, uh, mindfulness, meditation, that is being uh, studied. Somebody who deals with a different, with a difficult project knows what a core skill it is for a project manager to be resilient, and maybe that is also another piece of knowledge and experience that we could gather together and uh, to collect together and share with others. I wanted to be fast just to make sure I, you know, I leave the time for others, but. Along those lines, I, I can formulate in the next days what could be useful for others to, to, mm -hmm. to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcello. I think that's, I, I see also this as a next step for the group is narrow it down and, and, and focusing on a few areas we can really use our, our skills uh, and to have impact. So your list, it's been transcripted now by the system, so might need to have your input 
later on so that we can share it. Mm -hmm. if, if I may add one, one little thing is, the crisis is that you have multidisciplinary. So you bring multiple disciplines eh, from the first responders together to solve a problem. I think we have to go, and it's in line with the idea I'm working on with, with networks, is we have to, do, to look at transdisciplinary. Um, so not only having people from one particular group who are dealing with things, but bringing in other, other experts, uh, like, like we mentioned in the presentation. Also, why not bringing in philosophists? Why not bring in ethical people, uh, people who can think about ethical issues? It can expand your thinking. You bring in knowledge from different domains. We don't have to create new knowledge today. There is a lot of knowledge already there. So yeah. let's connect it uh, and, and, and bring it together. <clears throat> Your microphone is off, uh, Antonio. Uh, sorry, sorry, we're well, not. Thank you, Go. Yes, I think that's what comes clear to me is that how to connect the networks and, and create the network of the network where the information is. That's kind of something that's ticked in my mind so far in this half an hour. I have built from uh, in Switzerland and then Jonathan had something to, to, to ask as well. Go ahead, Bill. Good to see you. If you hear again this week, um, to me, my take on the call from a lot of reading that I've done is we're really in two kinds of crisis here. We're in a, in a life crisis or a medical crisis and an economic crisis. And it's easy for people to mix those two up. I'm an American. I'm based in France. My wife is Italian, so I've seen what's happened in Italy. I'm watching the Spanish situation. It makes me very sad. And, and I see the US is now um, America first in terms of uh, the number of cases. So that, that makes me sad. Um, I think this is a crisis of love. And I think this is a crisis of love. What can each of us do, and I mean each and every one of us, to stay at home for the next two weeks and stop this from going further. And that's, that's the challenge that, that I see. And let me just build one more point on that, Antonio, if I may. We all have two brains. We have the reptilian brain. That's the fight or flight, the one that when we get scared, we, we run back in the cave or we run away from the mammoth. Okay? And that brain likes to take charge of us. And then we have another brain. And that other brain is very much about thinking rationally and doing something positive. And I completely agree with your comment, Hugo. We have enough history about this. We don't have to reinvent anything. If we go back to two people, Viktor Frankl or Ada, Ava, Edith, Ava, Egger, who both lived some atrocities in the Second World War, each of those two individuals were able to maintain their rational brain and not let their reptilian brain hijack them. And I think that's our challenge. And those on this call, I feel we're privileged. A lot of people don't even have internet or they don't have someone to watch their kids or they don't even have an hour now. So how can we help others in the world to still feel their reptile brain. We have to feel the fear. You can't run away from it, but at the same time, strengthen the muscle of feeling the fear of our reptile brain and go on and let our thinking brain take over. And if we let the reptile brain take over, there've been a lot of studies. We lose 15% of our IQ right off the bat. So let me just throw that thought out there and, and let somebody else uh, ask some other questions or Bill, and thank you everyone for being here and I look forward to, to future calls. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Another thought, thought for stuff and I love the crisis of love. Yes, it's, um, it's uh, not heard that before. So, voila, something new. Let me move to Jonathan. You're in the UK. How are things in the UK? 
I, I don't know, but um, around Farnborough where I live, it's fine, but I, I, I have no idea beyond that. Um, certainly my, my, my sense of self and, and um, my, my locus has kind of shrunk down to, to our street, and I'm sure that's true of, of everybody else on the call. Um, I wanted to ask about this, this sense of, of permission, because the, the big thing that I feel, or one of the big things that has changed for the positive in this whole um, experience is, is whereas previously we had hundreds of challenges in projects um, the reason we weren't able to solve them was that we weren't allowed to that organizational um, governance systems and risk aversion and all of these other things kind of said no you can't do that you're not allowed to do that we now face a massive challenge but we're allowed to do to do almost anything and I want that people feel that organizations um, will come out of this um, more, more risk averse or whether they will be more risk seeking. Um, maybe they'll go in both directions. Um, and how we keep this sense of being allowed to do stuff going so that when the crisis, immediate crisis is over, we don't stop data sharing, we don't stop collaborating, we, we don't stop um, knowledge sharing, which are all of the things that I kind of focus on and which I find are so poor in most of the um, project environments in which I work. Um, and, and so that's, that's just, I'd, I'd welcome people's views on that. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Jonathan, very interesting. Anybody wants to talk, uh, Ugo or Stan, about Jonathan Point? No, maybe Martin, just, um, uh, you were, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Okay, sorry, because I see um, Antonio Froze. Now, Antonio, I, I find this, uh, um, uh, this sense of permission a great insight, just like Crisis of Love is one, but I think I mean, we have this unique opportunity to test and learn. We are being asked to test and learn to prototype. So probably this is, you know, there was also one of the points, Antonio, you had in your email. What are the opportunities? I mean, this mindset shift can, can get a huge amount of opportunity. I think we should really think in those terms. Now we not only are allowed, we're being asked to come up uh, with those ideas and, and execute those ideas. Thank you, Marcello. <clears throat> Anybody to comment on Jonathan? <clears throat> I, I want to, <clears throat> there, there's a lot of great things on the chat. I see I can save that, so that, that's good. I wanted also to ask uh, Golke to talk about what is happening in Turkey. I think this is already an opportunity that we can maybe support each other. Uh, and it's very, very quickly is happening now. Golce, can you hear that? Can you hear me? Good, perfect, because I'm having to use two laptops. For some reason in one, there's no voice. So um, uh, I hear from one and see, see you from the other one. The technology. Um, right, so um, the last time I spoke to you last Sunday, um, there were 1,000 cases in Turkey. As of yesterday, uh, there were about 7,300. So today we're expecting it to increase to about 9,000, unfortunately. Um, so it is increasing by 1,000, 2,000 every day, and I'm sure that increase will jump up to four or 5,000 as the number goes up. Um, uh, so I think uh, the, the Turkish government and uh, the Research and Development Center um, wanted to do something about it. And um, this week they announced a, a project call. Um, I, I don't know if I can share my screen with you um, so that you can see, or otherwise I can always send you the link. Um, perhaps I should just talk about it, not to um, waste too much time. 
Um, basically, um, they're saying that if we've got any project ideas that's to do with masks, protective clothing, equipment, medicine, vaccine, and IT applications that may affect the direct, um, direct or indirect consequences of the epidemic, um, then um, they're happy to, to fund up to $100,000. Um, um, so this is not a loan, this is a grant. Um, and, um, and we've been thinking about this in the company, in my company for a while, but we couldn't come up with the idea that will be beneficial. Um, but then we thought, well, if we ask around, um, we have the AI capability, um, we've been working on a project to deal with real time, big data, blockchain, um, front end, back end, full stack development. Um, so I thought if there, there's anybody out there with a great idea who needs um, a resource, um, we can apply together and see if we've got funding because um, they, they'd like to go, go ahead very quickly um, with this particular project call. So we will know, we, we, need, we need to send the application by 2nd of April and they only announced it a couple of days ago. Um, so they're looking for quick fixes um and um they'll announce the results within 10 days after the second so it would be 12th of uh, april um again you know i just wanted to let you know guys there's a project call out there for some uh funding if you have ideas um about the sort of it solutions um that we can help implement we are here um any questions are most welcome Thank you, Golcha. It's very. I think it's great to to see this coming, and and hopefully just one of many initiatives that we can collaborate. So I will share the link. I will share your contacts, and we're open in here for question for ideas. Um, uh, so and we need to react very quickly. So I, I'm really happy to see something practical. Um, Thank you. We'll, we'll follow up on email on that one. I see there's a question here from Sudhir. Sudhir, can you open your mic? Hi. Um, I hope I'm audible. So um, uh, I'm actually thinking that here we have an extremely rich and powerful forum of business leaders. Uh, all of us have gone through different types of crisis in our lifetime supporting different business or other challenges and so on so the key question here to the crisis management experts in the call is where are they seeing a lack of thought leadership uh, any sectors where they are seeing specific challenges which a group of people can come together in a huddle and people who have already seen it in the past or who have enough creative acumen from the past that they can come together to solve some real problems and so on because we we understand the supply chain problem we understand the the medical pro industry problems and so on but are there some specific area which is not getting enough attention that we can step in and make a difference uh, today tomorrow this week so that there is already some nudge in the recovery rather than waiting for things to be clear so that's essentially my question Maybe oh, go stand, yeah. Maybe just uh, from my point, it's, it's a very good question because going back to the transdisciplinary take on things, everything touches everything. If if, if this crisis or these crises show us and learn us one thing, that is that the whole uh, of our activity on a very broad scale touches everything. So it is a bowl of spaghetti now and. Uh, it's the borders are gone and, and and it's a very interesting question therefore but in, in my reflex um i would say the the different governments need to translate their str str strategy on how to cope with this as a nation uh to to the lowest level of their society the society and that's something that i see that this is one of the, the biggest challenges because everybody also it's also a critique in Europe, uh, sadly, that, that everybody's having a different strategy to cope with this. But how to translate this uh, to the lowest levels and 
don't want to use the word lowest level, but from all the levels in, in your society, from, from I see SMEs, yes, but also religious groups. I see uh, um, different religious groups uh, are dealing totally different with measures of, uh, of government. So I see there is a lot of work to be done to, uh, on the short term, on the long term, we will have to look at broader things on the on the part of the whole supply chain which is the, the, the globalization and and how legislation and um and the legislation terms um the lawmakers and then the regulators deal with this 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 will be on the long term in my opinion one of the biggest challenges to look at this from a very broad supply chain um uh, perspective but keep thinking because i know there will be different uh, uh, opinions on this just a very small thing I'd like to add to what Stan just said, um, and maybe I go in against what everyone is hoping for, but I don't believe in quick fixes. In this case, there are no quick fixes. Um, but that's what our rational brain, linking to what Bill just said, that, that's what our rational brain uh, comes up with. Um, so the emotional brain is very often looking to the, to the rational brain. And please have a read on what um, Daniel Kahneman was writing about this, together with, uh, with Tversky, uh, on how we mislead ourselves uh, and constantly think that we can come up and find a, a magic stick and, and fix the whole thing. I don't believe in it. I do believe in very small initiatives uh, learning why we're doing this, uh, being disruptive also for ourselves, uh, collecting the data. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? And this is what I see that a lot of organizations here in Belgium are already doing. They are capturing all the data, all the, the decisions they make and try to learn afterwards. And if we can do that, but it won't be a quick fix. If we can do that, we can, and I'm, I'm truly believe this, we can come out stronger. <laughs> And afterwards, learn from this because this will not be the last pandemic that we that we're gonna have. Definitely not. Thank you. I wanted to ask uh, Luan if you can share a bit uh, your thoughts. I've been uh, following what you said, um, Luan. If you can speak. Sure. I guess um, I know that this is a really incredibly challenging time and and I really appreciate all the wonderful comments I feel really inspired and I know that we're living in a very difficult time right now but I I also believe I really believe that we are capable of helping to maybe slow the descent um, and the rate of descent and the depth that we find ourselves in but also at the same time start thinking about what it is that we want to look like and be on the other side of this and start to create that now and every day. And through this type of mechanism that you've set up, Antonio, it's an opportunity for us to connect with all of these wonderful ideas and thoughts today. And I'm inspired to think about what is it that I can do when I get off this call that can make a positive difference in the smallest of ways. Um, at a local level and then thinking about how we as a, a group of leaders and professionals with incredibly interesting and diverse interdisciplinary and international skills can come together. I love the ideas of uh, we, we're all in this together. We need ethicists, we need engineers, we need scientists, we need um, healthcare workers, we need everybody to try to work together uh, to come up with some ideas. and. I don't know, maybe something that um, I'm trying to think of ways specifically that PMI can respond in this situation, but um, I like the idea that uh, Gocha, I think that's how you pronounce your name, I can't remember exactly, but um, the idea of having some sort of an idea fund that uh, allows people to, because we all have a lot of collective interest in trying to do something, and I think we feel somewhat helpless to being able to do it. And so somehow um, creating a mechanism that allows us to leverage all this great thinking and actually produce outcomes, however small, but leveraging our global talent and passion to do something and make something happen. So 
I've, I've got a lot to think about as a result of this morning, and I so appreciate you taking the time to make this happen, and all of you for being here today. It's just a, a wonderful start to the day thinking about how the possibilities of what we could do to make a difference, so thank you. Thank you, Leon. I wanted also to ask Christiane, uh, you've been, uh, well, I think you've gone through many phases in your career and, and startups and small businesses, so maybe you can share a bit your views as well you've been writing. Yeah, <clears throat> the thing is that um, in, in my whole life I had some very s real crisis from losing my parents as a teenager and living in a country which is not my, my own because I'm, I'm German but I grew up in, in Spain and uh, yeah, the, the thing is later I had the bankruptcy when I was 32 with a two year or two years old uh, baby. Sorry, I have my WhatsApp here. I think you are, uh, sorry. And uh, what I have learned uh, from all this shit happened uh, because it happens. Not only everybody of us has uh, this kind of problems in any moment, some more, some less, but after my bankruptcy, I, it took me one year to figure out what happened uh to see where we're um, to discover that there was a big part of my own responsibility of course in this case now what we have globally it's it's, it's not the not the, the the responsibility of the individuals now there's happened something and we cannot do nothing but um there are people who are in now because spain is a mess really i'm in madrid i'm stuck in madrid i couldn't leave in time I'm 20 days alone now uh, because my daughter and my girlfriend are in Malaga. It's like 600 kilometers for them. And when we expected that the quarantine came in, I told them not to come because already in Spain, in Madrid, they were, they were putting the first uh, army hospital from the military hospitals here. I said, oh my God, this will not, will not go, and go well. So I told them to stay there. And I had a lot of time to be now alone here and to, to think why a lot of people are in much better position and than others. For example, my clients, most of my clients don't have any problems. I have a lot of doctors. They are fucked up, absolutely. And I really worry about them and I, I, I write them a lot and uh, basically to give them some, some emotional. Spain is, people are okay with all the medical and people and from nurses to everybody because they support them each night at eight o'clock, they go out to, to give them, uh, I don't know how to say this, uh, Antonio Tocan Las Palmas, to, to give them the support. Yeah. But uh, a lot of other people around me are really screwed up because uh, the layoffs are starting. Uh, we're expecting a big part of the people who are, will, a lot of people already lost it, even if the government is saying now it's forbidden to, to cancel contracts on this, to, but it's stupid because the companies, the businesses will shut down if they cannot, if they are not viable anymore uh, economically, they will shut down and then it will go even worse. And it looks like in Spain, for example, it's, I think it's impossible to do it worse as a government. They have done everything bad and, uh, and late. But the thing is, uh, how we can help people? I'm trying to to find all my to give all my free time um, to to help people to support small businesses, because for individuals uh, to push them up emotionally, okay, there are a lot of people who can can do it better than me, but I I I'm, I'm more nah, not specialized, but I have done I am I'm in business since since 1998, and I run around 20 projects. Some was real mess, others I sold, others was a big success, some I have, I still have them. And there's where that's my point. I can, I can help people, I can give them my experience. But my experience for sure is not completely uh, to bring them to other country, to other cultures, to other languages. So for example, to be here in this group, it's amazing. Uh, my mother language is uh, Spanish and German and English. Okay, that's what I can talk, but for example, with these kind of groups in Spain, we cannot do a lot. Normally, Sp English is not uh, very well introduced, even in business areas. Uh, but I think if we can find the way to say, here we have a, amazing people, amazing group, a tons of knowledge. If we can break down this knowledge 
to in any in kind of uh, smaller sub network local networks to say for example okay i can support in spanish the other one in italian in english in hindi and whatever in any languages uh, to support there but from the knowledge of the higher here and what we are here in this group uh, where we can move uh, much more than for example me alone i i'm doing i, I created in the first weekend i created a facebook group uh, where I put uh, success stories of people who are starting to reinvent themselves uh, with their business to, to change their traditional business, for example. No? And I, I put a lot of uh, people who started in, from my network to give courses out for free. And there was an uh, Amazon bestseller author who was giving his uh, course for writers for free, another one for sales, and this and this. I started to do interviews in, in Spanish with people who could give value to, about sales, about marketing, about whatever, and put all this stuff in the group for free, obviously, but to concentrate, not because in my, in my in, in feed from Facebook, it will get lost. So imagine now, for example, if we could find a way to, there are a lot of software out there like teachable.com or some, they are free, and to, to, to create a structure in different languages and where we can, everybody of us, each of us, we have people. If we cannot do it ourselves, Sure, we can find people around us who has content. We can create small courses, some master classes, where we can put content, like an academy, an online academy, for free, a global one. But in a global structure, but with small substructures by languages or countries. And then to ask people, come, come on, give a master class, 50 minutes. Obviously, with the, the absolute point, not to make it a, a, say, a sales pitch. This has, should be the, the, the absolute uh, request to people not to, co to, to convert it to, to trying to sell stuff. If somebody can buy something from them later, okay. But this could be an idea to say how we can bring together our global knowledge because it's unbelievable. Uh, I have been, I had not too much time to research each of you in, the, in LinkedIn, but some, so come on, it is amazing. I'm not a studied guy. I couldn't go to university because of my death of my parents. So what I know, I learned it by falling down, coming back, falling down, coming back, and this a lot of times. Believe me, I'm not. I'm not sad. I am not a little bit tired sometimes to fail. But I say, if my fails can help others to not to save time. Because now people don't have time. The thing is, uh, somebody told it, it's a thing of now to do now something and uh, to have, see where we can find the point to, to bring together the solutions where people can learn, can be motivated. Okay, Ob obviously that can see, okay, it's not the, the final point of my life. I can go to the business again or I can start looking for a job, different way, remote working. I work remotely for 15 years now. So yeah, I, uh, this is my point. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. Very, very inspiring to, to hear your story and, and what you're doing to help in Madrid. I know the, the situation is dramatic. I, I don't want to rush with time, but I do want to stay with the deadlines a bit. Um, my proposal, well, this is so rich. I, you know, I, I've been thinking about the call since we finished the previous one. So my proposal is uh, to have a bit more regular calls. You, John, if you can, if not, you can see it. Um, I, I, I think we can bring, we're in a phase of exploration. I think we're dumping ideas and getting to know each other and expanding. Um, but I think we're soon now moving into a space where we can maybe identify three or five areas. We can start going into details and splitting smaller groups. So everybody can contribute um, uh, in the area that they feel more comfortable. Um, I will, and I think anybody can bring people that they know to keep inspiring us. I've uh, talked to Marshall Goldsmith. Um, he's a good friend of Bill and, and, and other people in the call who call. Uh, he's the number one um, executive coach in the world. He has advices, CEOs, uh, Boeing, Ford, World Bank. So he's coming to the call on Wednesday. I've shifted to the evening so that the people like Luan doesn't need to wake up so early and there's people in Australia who want to join. So mind the timing, it won't fit everybody, but it will be recorded. Uh, I know Rita McGrath is in the group and Rita is the guru in strategy. So if we're thinking about the future of 
uh, strategy in business, I will ask Rita to, to give us a, a, her views. And, and you talk about disruption. We know Whitney Johnson who came with the disrupt yourself book. So we can ask her to come and say, how can we disrupt ourselves? So I think there, there, we need to work in parallel, maybe start uh, with some working groups and start bringing thinkers and people uh, concrete ideas like Golche, where we can uh, start collecting already some uh, ideas. Some of them will be big, some others local, small. Uh, but, and then I heard that Slack, it's a good tool to keep the momentum. I don't want to create another WhatsApp because I think we're overloaded with WhatsApp. So I heard that Slack helps you to just chat. Uh, everybody follows. We can do like with the chat here. Uh, built on an ideas and we don't need to wait until the next call. That's kind of the way I see it. But again, this is not my initiative, it's our initiative. So uh, whatever you think we can do different or on top of what I just said, um, it's so much welcome. Um, it's, it, uh, that's how I see it. We can break down into smaller groups. Maybe first make a list of all the ideas like Marcello started and then focus groups that can work concretely in something that we can take an action uh, and test it uh, whatever we can and and I like the influential of politicians as well these are big decisions makers which are I think completely lost so how can we reach to these people with something that makes sense to them um, I think that would be another area where we need to go in detail and and Hugo, Stan, thank you very much for being here. You're welcome to join the group and, and, and keep advising us and helping. Um, I, I just feel like I wish I could hear your opinion, but I think it's just going to be too difficult. So let's do it by this Slack. I'll find out how it works and I'll share that and we'll create a community. Uh, any advice you have on this, just or you want to take the lead, perfect. Um, but um, uh, let me just finish here. Um, I, I know your families and need you and, and friends and, and I'm sure you have a full agenda of, of video calls as well. Um, but thank you so much. It's just, uh, I feel always great after this call and, and with more ideas and I start to see things a bit more clear. So. Please, uh, yeah, continue, reach out. Uh, hopefully we can create this big chat room where we can all build on each other's ideas. Um, and, and that's it. Thank you, Hanwa, for bringing Hugo and Stan. Uh, and um, yeah, I think it's tough times, but these are kind of, Laszlo was saying, rich moments to put in finally networks into practice. and. We don't know where this is going to go, but just the fact to talk and see each other, it, it just gives much more, yeah, uh, sense to what we're doing. So thank you. Sorry to stop here, but I think it's better. Um, sorry also for the timings. We just switched uh, times on here and I didn't realize, but I hope to see you on Wednesday and uh, before that, we'll, we'll continue the chatting and trying to come up with something more concrete. So, thank you very much and just uh, keep safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Thanks, Antonio. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Antonio, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.